or First Peter uh, 1, verses 6 and 7. I'm going to read them from the King James. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Please, if you have a pen, pencil, or mentally, just circle one word. It's actually three in the English and the Greek. It's one. Might be found is actually one Greek word. Might be found in the King James, which in, I'll write it phonetically for, from the Greek into the English would look like this, eurythe, which is actually where we get our word for eureka. Eureka. If that word doesn't do something for you, it was a word made popular way before the California gold rush by a Greek uh, philosopher, but it was made popular, and obviously in the gold rush time when people panned for gold here, in 48, and then the 49ers came. No, not the team, the miners. <laughs> panning for gold. And contrary to uh, what some people who don't know, like myself, slightly ignorant of the process of mining for gold, it was those small, tiny little fragments that would, people would call out and say, Eureka! Translating, I found it, gold. So when I have you circle, might be found... It's speaking of your faith. And our faith is, I coined the word, de-drossified, full of, full of dross as we go through the fires of life. And that may not be very appealing to some people. I know as a young Christian starting out a few years back, the idea of having to go through things, I could even entertain trying to say Jesus' words a little bit differently. Out of Luke, when Jesus said, Father... And I used to say, if it be possible. Well, he says that somewhere else, but in Luke's gospel, he actually says, if you'll remove this cup, if you'll remove it, nevertheless, the cup speaking of his death, nevertheless, not my will but thine. And I'm starting to realize that God, God really loves me a lot, and he loves you a lot, because we are an afflicted people. We have so many things that come on us. I know this is not a popular message. If I wanted to make it real popular, I'd say it's all good. And the flip side is, as a paradox, it is all good if you understand what the suffering and the sorrow and the trials and the temptations are for. So keep this in mind. Keep the idea of eureka. I found it. That is your faith, my faith, that it be tried. Keep that in mind. And I'm going to take you to the book of Job. Wow. All right. Now, for some, they may say, well, Pastor, tell me, because I'm kind of new here, what exactly is faith? And uh, believe me, I think that when we really begin to understand faith, Hebrews 11 is not a definition, per se. It's not defining, but it at least puts you to the right path. You must come to the place as a Christian to sufficiently stand on God's word, that God gave this word, the same word that when he spoke in the beginning and out of nothing came everything, that same speaker of the word spoke promises that according to Corinthians are ours to claim in Christ, And I place my entire being, like a coat being hung on a rock somewhere, I place my entire being on that word until it comes to pass. Whatever I have latched onto, like the coat hanger, my earthen clothes are that which I'm hanging on to, God's word, and appropriating that which circumstance denies. Things look bleak. But yet faith says, it's not what God said. That's not what God promised me. And until that promise becomes a reality, I keep reaching and I keep hanging on. So forgive me for the very short uh, 
introduction, but I want, I want Job to speak to us today. I want this to be not just a sermon or another passage we read together. I'm really praying that Job, you'll see Job in a new light. You will take this and understand there's something much more important than what the natural eye sees in your circumstance. Job, chapter 1, we get a glimpse of the character of this man. And, you know, I, I think sometimes we kind of distance ourselves from these people in the Bible because it says of Job, uh, a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, a man that was perfect, literally he was pious, upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. We get a glimpse of his character. And that tends to warp the immediate idea of how we read the rest of the story. For starters, Job's name, from a correct translation of his name, would be persecuted or penitent. Nice name. That's his name. Names are important in the Bible, so just remember that. And supposedly, if, if we just had nowhere else to go except verse 1, perfect, pious, upright, feared God, eschewed evil, but his name still translates persecuted or penitent. Right there is a walking contradiction. So, now we see Job's blessings, his prosperity. Born unto him seven sons and three daughters. And if you've read this a million times, make this the first, not the million and one. Make it the first time, fresh eyes. His substance also, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, a great household, uh, so that this man was the greatest of all men in the East. So we have a picture of Job's character, of his prosperity. He had great substance, children, basically had everything here. And now we get a glimpse into the man's dedication his upward look to God. It says, His sons went and feasted in their houses. Everyone his day sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So everybody's going to have a feast party, whatever you want to call it. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And Job did this continually. Now, just take a, it's a snapshot of someone who appears to be so reverent to God, so faithful and so dedicated. So remember the next time when somebody says, how suffering occurs. Here is a, a, a good man, a godly man, and he's about to have the ride of his life. Okay then. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. I had taken the Septuagint, which is that second, third century before Christ translation from the Hebrew into the Greek, to find a few neat things. It says that when Satan is, they actually don't translate him as Satan here, they call him the devil. And he says here that he came in from compassing the earth and walking up and down in the world. Kind of adds a little additional flavor that he wasn't just going on a morning jog and showed up for church in the heavens. Now, I want you to think about this. Scholars have debated the authorship of this, and I don't want to. Surprise. And the reason why I don't want to is because rather than trying to figure out how old this book is, there are clues, by the way, and rather than trying to figure out who, I want you to catch one real important thing. Whoever this writer is, he got a glimpse into heaven that we don't have because he's seeing something happening in heaven that we don't. So, the Lord said unto Satan, 
Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? You know what that's like saying? That's like, uh, let's just say you have a store and you find a, f- a thief in front of your store and you ask him, have you considered coming in, breaking in and stealing any of my goods? <laughs> that's how much God esteemed Job and Job's reverence for God. And this is kind of interesting. It gets more interesting as we go. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Kind of a typical, you know, if you really read about Satan, it's kind of typical. Did God really say to Eve? Always getting us to doubt and to question. And here he has the audacity to question God. Think about that. And we we think there's no possible risk that we may be afflicted or tempted by him. But he had the audacity to God. Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and all that he has on every side? Hast thou blessed the work of his hands? His substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now. Touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. Satan is saying to God, God, you put forth your hand. You afflict him. But instead, this is what is so amazing. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, literally in thy hands, not in thy power, in thy hands. Only upon himself put, don't touch him, only upon the man, Don't touch him, his life. So Satan went forth from the presence of the the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine with their eldest brother's brother's house. And here it comes. And I want you to take note of how these massive amounts of destruction are going to occur. There came a messenger unto Job, saying, The oxen were plowing, the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them, took them away. They've slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I'm the only one that escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, you saw me do this the other night, there came also another and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven. Didn't say the fire of Satan, the fire of God, another messenger. Second one. So we have a, by man's hand, the Sabaeans, the first one, fire of God. Could have been lightning, could have been any number of things, but it's attributed to God as the messenger delivers the message. All the sheep, all the servants, I'm the only one to survive to tell you about this. While he was yet speaking, I would have just said, don't talk. While he was yet speaking, there came also another. The Chaldeans made out three bands, and now everything else, all the rest of the possessions are gone. So we have... A group of men, what would be considered an act of God, fire of God fallen from heaven. Another group of men. And then while he was yet speaking, there also came another one saying, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. That's an admonition for the fundamentalist to uh, not gather in the oldest person's house and drink wine. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, perhaps such as a tornado or something. Great wind. And the house collapsed. Everybody's dead. In one day, everything is gone. All right? We have another instance. Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down on the ground, prostrated himself. And he said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. You notice he didn't say the Lord gave, and Satan hath taken away. He said the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. This is a hard message. It's very hard. But Job will elaborate on this. And then he does something that I've been trying to tell you and I to do when I began 1 Peter in verse 3. Blessed, 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. How many weeks have I been saying out of Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord. I will, no matter what. I will speak good words, God word, no matter what. Job has just in one fell swoop his wealth, his prosperity, the possibility of future family. It's all gone. You and I, let's be honest here. You and I would have been sitting and probably not blessing God. You and I would have probably first... I'm doing it politely now. I'm staying with the polite one. You can do the colloquial for you. Just do it in your mind or something. What on earth is going on? That was the polite version. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You remember that Greek word? Eulogitos. He is eulogitosing, speaking good words. Barach in the Hebrew. Speaking good words, God words. Still praising him even in the midst of this calamity. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. And again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. He's always seemingly on the scene. And again, the question is asked, uh, here we go again. The Lord said unto Satan, where are, you, where are you coming from? Satan answered the Lord and said, came from going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down it. And uh, I'm sure he wasn't doing shopping. He's a thief. He just takes. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth? Seems strange, like a repetition, perfect, upright, one that fears God, eschews evil, and... Still, he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou, God is speaking, thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath, <clears throat> all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Hmm. Taking away his family and his money and houses wasn't enough. Touch his skin. Here comes sickness and disease. This is why I said to you, it's a difficult message, but if we can see through it, it will cease to be paper and it will become an engrafted word for us in the middle of our crisis whatever they may be. And if you're not in a crisis now, I've said, don't worry, eventually you'll be in one, yeah? And you'll need it. It's like uh, something you keep in your back pocket for a rainy day. Uh, Pun intended. So, Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. So bad, later on it says these boils were. This is kind of gross, I know, but it's in here. That they got infected. They were pussy and disgusting, and eventually dirt got in them, and worms, ah, were kind of feeding on the sores. Pretty bad state to be. You know, if you've ever had an itch where you have just winter dry skin and you can't get any relief and you keep scratching and scratching, and then, it, it you know, you can put some cream and it goes away, but poor man, he had these boils, like don't even want to think about it. He takes, he finds a piece of broken pottery and he's scraping his skin and just the sight of, the imagination of that is just so horrid. Covered from head to toe, mind you. And his wife said unto him, his wife appears, she's not dead yet. (laughs) His wife said unto him, dost thou still retain thine integrity? Nice wife, curse God and die. Let me tell you, don't be too harsh with this woman. She has just seen the loss of her children. She has just seen all of her goods, her earthly goods are gone. Don't be too harsh with her. Uh, Some of us probably wouldn't have even lasted that long. Now, again, what on earth is going on here. If you want the answer, 
you will not find it on earth. It is the most important heavenly transaction. Make this a mirror for yourself. What you see on earth and what happens to you here may not ultimately be the very thing you think in its idea. There was a heavenly transaction going on here. Satan said to God, your servant that you prize, that you say is so good and so upright, I'll show you. We'll take away his things. We'll take away his health. We'll break him down to where he is so depressed. He will curse you. He will turn against you. I like God. He kind of went, okay, go ahead. Make my day. See, I think somebody else said it before the Hollywood people got that. (laughs) And so... I want you to think about this. Right here, Job could have opened his mouth and said, right here, I want you to think of a heavenly picture. I believe there were 10,000, or whatever the number is you want to say, of heavenly host, of angelic beings. And you know that picture in Revelation 8, 1, where it speaks of silence in the heavens for the space of about 30 minutes. I believe all heaven was hushed. A pin drop. Not even an angel dancing on a pin top, but just you could have heard a pin drop. The silence must have been, here's a great uh, contradiction of words, deafening. As all this heavenly host stood by, looking down at Job, waiting to hear what would come out of his mouth. Not what on earth is going on with Job or what on earth is going on. Phil, put your name in the blanks. Heavenly transaction. This is why I said the writer led us into the heavens to see there was some greater transaction of some magnificent huge value for us to take to ourselves that every action down here, every window of faith, there is a heavenly counterbalance to that, an opportunity where the heavenly angels are looking in at you and at I, and in this case, focusing in on Job and silence. I I, I have a picture in my mind that there was silence in the heavens. I think Satan must have been standing thinking, I got it, I got it. And I believe as soon as Job opens his mouth and says these words, I believe that there was an eruption in the heavenly so loud, I envision it, I, I read this, and I think of the heavenly host breaking out into an absolute Holy, 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 worthy is the Lamb, holy. He says to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaketh. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God and not receive evil? In this, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I believe at the moment that he made this declaration... Now, you might say, well, what about the rest of the book? Well, if you come back next week, I might tell you a little bit about that. (laughs) But the greater lesson I want to harness here is that when we reflect back on the passage that I read in opening 1 Peter 1, 6 and 1, 7, we don't recognize the eureka status, our faith, Here is a moment in the heavenlies that if they weren't crying out, holy, 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 worthy is the Lamb, they were crying out, Eureka, I found it in my servant Job. And one of the most profound things, you know, we can read through and really take the scripture and if we digest it and kind of let it get in under our skin, we recognize something. These passages are given for us not to say what on earth, but the heavenly perspective. Whoever recorded this and whoever the person is tells us something fantastic, that immediately after Job's proclamation of shall we not receive good and evil, 
And later on, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. And all of these that are looking Godward, I believe Satan fled. We speak about resisting the devil and resist him and he'll flee from you. But there's one thing Satan hates more than we can possibly even fathom. Praising God and still exercising faith while the whole universe that you see around you is collapsing. Satan hates that. It makes him flee. In fact, stay where you are in in the passage you're at. I want to read a scripture to you to kind of just put a capstone on this. From the same book, 1 Peter 4. Don't turn there because I'm going to go elsewhere. And verses 12 and 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. That's, that's what's wrong with most of us. We get conditioned to thinking that stuff is happening and therefore it's not normal. This passage from 1 Peter 4 and 12 and 13 says, uh, weren't you expecting this? Hello. And not only that, but this very same book in chapter 5 says be sober and be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour whom resist uh, resist steadfast in the faith the most difficult concept to tell people as they're going through you know I have great sympathy for Job His friends come from afar. Oh, boy, brace yourselves, because I'm going to go at this for a minute here. I have to indulge just to give you some comfort. So when you leave here, you'll say, I'm normal. (laughs) I'm speaking of you. I may not be, but I think you are. (laughs) Three friends come from afar. Eliphaz. These are all, I love the names. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Three friends that seemingly, if you begin to read the story, they came from afar, they saw him. You know, grief has a way of taking its toll on you. To where sometimes people see you and they say, I didn't even recognize the person. We've all seen and been there and done that by some means. And these seven, three friends seem to be really uh, right on. They come and they spend seven days and seven nights quietly, just spending time with Job, they're mourning. And then we begin this whole exchange. There are three cycles. I won't go into detail about them, but there are three cycles in the book of Job. Three distinct cycles of conversation between Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, Zophar, Job. Three patterns. If you read the first one, Eliphaz starts off as quite... He sounds reasonable. He sounds reasonable. Basically, what he's going to insinuate to to Job is he's going to say, you know, listen to what I tell you, brother. Man, you know, I'm going to go in my timeout corner here for a minute. You know, because sometimes I feel like I'm in my timeout corner. So some brother comes along and says, you know, you know, Sister Scott, you know why you're in the doghouse? Because, you know, you're not living righteously. There's sin in your life. And if you just live a sin-free life and be a better be a better Christian, you wouldn't have these tribulations. The Lord would bless you and prosper you. You have friends like that, folks? You know what your real pro- you know what your real problem is, Blaine? You know what you know your real problem is? Well, oh, great, she's now going to tell me what my problem is. Well, that's it. Eliphaz says, Your real problem is that you, you have unconfessed sin. And and if you'll just if you'll just do what I'm telling you to do, the Lord will work it out for you. These friends, and there are many friends like this in the body of Christ today, uh, they like to come and tell you, if you just make a couple of tweaks and changes, it'll all get good, and, you know, it'll all work out. Here's the thing. I don't need a brother or sister to come and tell me about how it's going to work out. The Word tells me. And there are many promises in God's book. Uh, I'll tell you one of them is out of Psalm 119, that very large psalm that says, Thy word is tried. That meaning 
It has been put through the fire. It has been tested. Therefore, forever, O Lord, thy word settled in heaven. It's made it through the eternities and been a steadfast place of refuge for all of those that came before me. Let me lean on that. So, somewhere in the 19th chapter, Job says something quite incredible. Remember, he's cursing the day he was born. Everything is gloom and despair. I don't know why, and I I can't accept any of this. And all of a sudden, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. The beginning of sight, when you can't see. I know that my Redeemer lives. Fascinating to me that as we go on in 1 Peter, in 1.8, it says, Having loved someone, speaking of Christ, you've not seen. Job had not seen. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And I'm reading out of my NIV now, so you're not confused. It's a different translation. And that in the end, he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Think about this because this vessel that is tethered to the earth, that is, as we get a little older, we were younger, we were kind of, you know, we were, uh, we didn't think we'd have some physical breakdowns. You know, while we're young, we're we're strong and we take it for granted and as we get a little bit older, it's just a little bit of aches and pains and then it starts with that ain't working, that's broke, no plumber can fix that and those things cannot be repaired no matter how much you try. Although we do live in Hollywood, all things are possible here. (laughs) He says, I will see God. And then we're going to go on a little bit further to some changes that are going on with Job. As as faith is beginning to well up, and now jump over with me into the 23rd chapter. And I'll try and see if it reads kind of the same. 23rd chapter. Yes. Yes. 23 and verse 10. Read from the King James. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Remember that. While you are going through, God has not abandoned. The same God who saw you on the sunny day, by the way, is by your bedside when you go to bed at night is with you. You know, when you're up and you can't sleep and the eyes are like being held open by toothpicks, close your eyes. God's 24-7. Go to sleep knowing that in the night he is there. But he knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me, I shall. Not I might. I shall come forth as gold. I will, my NIV reads, I will come forth as gold. We are his treasure somewhere else out of Peter and out of Deuteronomy. We are his treasure. He knows the way I take when he has tested me. I will come forth as gold. It is that treasure that he seeks. He knows we are his treasure. And then, um, I'm just going to maybe give you a sweeter overview of all this because there are all these chapters filled in and then suddenly, just suddenly, another gentleman appears on the scene by the name of Elihu. People get him confused and they think that he's part of Eliphaz and Zophar and Bildad. He's not. He appears on the scene. He is not part of the friends and uh, you will read it clearly. I'll explain it to you on festival and tell you why he's not part of these other friends. And what is remarkable about this man as he comes on the scene, let's turn there. Uh, He comes on the scene real late there. So um, I'm going to have you go to chapter 32. This is just kind of a big overview to get get us to walk away today with a, a good picture of how God is in control no matter what. Sends this man, Elihu, uh, Elihu's name is my God is he. And strangely enough, I don't really know who Elihu is. He may have been the one that wrote this book. Because he was there all along listening 
He's going to open his uh, conversation like this. In fact, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to read out of the NIV today because I've got all my notes in my NIV. You may follow along in your King James. And that is beginning at chapter 32. So these three men stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But Elihu, the son of Barachel, which means the son of whom God blesses, the Buzite, or the family of Ram. Yeah, if you can imagine that, the Buzite, that's a good family of Ram from the family of Hai. All names mean something for some reason, it's not just willy-nilly. He became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. He was also angry with the three friends. That tells you he's not part of the equation. Because they had found no way to refute Job and yet had condemned him. Now, let me just say one thing to you. And I hope in the coming weeks you'll, you'll hear me out. If we're in Christ, and supposedly we claim to be Christians, we say Christ is our Lord and Savior. If we're in Christ, Romans declares there is therefore now no ultimate condemnation. And who Who shall lay charge to anything, any one of God's elect? God is in charge now, as you've committed your way. So people that come to point the finger and say, Aha! You there, yeah. Think of Job's friends, and instead of wanting to say something nasty, just say Eliphaz, or just call him Zophar, or Bildad. You get the picture. God already knows. Now, Elihu had waited before speaking to Job because they were older than he. But when he saw the three men had nothing more to say, his anger was aroused. And if you watch the cycle of conversation, the first cycle is very long. And then in the second cycle, Eliphaz gets a little bit more, uh, you know, a little bit more gutsy. And what's so amazing in the third cycle, Zophar has nothing to say. He is silent. Talents is golden, isn't it? So, Elihu begins a whole discourse that will last effectively six chapters are entwined in his discourse. And I want you to take note of this. Nowhere is Job going to refute such as he did with his other friends. He's not going to try and refute what Elihu's saying because Elihu was a forerunner to God speaking. And this is the sum total of what he says. It sounds like, if you read it quickly, it sounds like, well, what's the difference between Elihu and these other three guys? Elihu's going to really just hit the nail on the head. And he begins to talk to him and say some very profound things. He says, for example, in chapter 33, the Spirit of God has made me. He tells Job to listen carefully. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. I, too, have been taken from clay. So you know that Elihu is just a man. And then he begins to say like this. Does, I think that's chapter, uh, chapter 33 and verse 14. For God does speak now one way, now another, though man may not perceive it. Now, we're told in the book of Hebrews that in these last days he has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Listen to the wisdom. He says, In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men as they slumber in their beds, he may speak to them in their ears and with terrifying things, warning them uh, to turn a man from wrongdoing. And then the other place here, he says, Or a man may be chastened on a bed of pain with constant distress in his bones, so that this very being finds food repulsive, His soul loathes the choicest meals. And he goes on to basically say, God can talk to people in different ways, as he's declaring to Job. And then, spin on to chapter 34. And I'm just going to keep reading. I've managed to color another book, folks. Yes. Elihu says, Hear my words, you wise men. Listen to me, you men of learning. For the ear tests words as the tongue tastes food. Let us discern for ourselves what is right. And he goes on to just slam the friends and Job, and he says, finally, a culmination of this just remarkable passage. 
Who appointed him, speaking of God, who appointed him over the earth? Who put him in charge of the whole world? Who did this? And he even gives Job the license, you know, if you want to answer, go ahead. Who did this? There is no dark place, no deep shadow where evildoers can hide from God. And in amazement, in chapter 35, verse 6, he says, if you sin, how does that affect God? Nobody ever asked the question. We're so concerned about brothers and sisters looking on. What does God think? He knows our frame. He knows our condition. And then he says, bear with me a little longer. Chapter 36, will I show you that there's more to be said on God's behalf? God is mighty, does not despise men. He is mighty and firm in his purpose. Well, what, pray tell me, is his purpose? That we should be conformed to the image and likeness now of his son, Jesus Christ. And how does he accomplish that? We're looking at it. Eureka, the trying of your faith. Oh, make this easy for me. Well, I will. I'll make it real easy. Because it gets real easy when God talks. God makes it so plain that I'm just going to kind of step out of the way and tell you how God sees us. Go to chapter 38 and get your pen out to do some, some writing here. The Lord speaks. The Lord answered Job out of the storm, and he says the following. And I want you to notice these are by category. God is going to start first with the earth, the sea, the dawn. God's going to break this down for Job, and he's going to ask him some really profound questions, beginning with this. He says to Job, brace yourself like a man. I'm going to question you, and then you're going to answer me. Now, I'm sure Job was saying, got any depends? God's talking. Brace yourself like a man. You get ready. And here it comes. This is mind-boggling. God is speaking to Job, and he says, Were you there when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Were you there? Who marked off its dimension? Surely. Wise. Job, you know, don't you? Were you there? Did you do it? Who stretched a measuring line across it? That's the picture he's given. And then the sea. Who shut up the sea behind the doors? Were you there? What about the dawn? Have you ever understood this? Have you ever given orders to the morning? Job, do you control when the sun comes up or when the sun goes down? What about the vastness of the sea? These are all categories. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Tell me if you know all this. It goes back. God's going to go back to the light and the dusk. He says, what is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can, can you take me to those places? Hey, listen, if you can answer these questions, Job, Melissa Scott, fill in the blank, God's going to move on to talk about the snow, the hail, the rain, the frost. Keep looking up a little bit higher because above the snow, the hail, the rain, the frost right there, verses 31, 32, he says, can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their season? Can you do this? Last time I checked, Job, I'm sovereign. I'm the one that Hung those stars in the sky. It's not some accident that occurred. I don't care what textbook you want to read. And then he goes back to the rain and the clouds. Can you raise your voice to the clouds? And this is when you, you see God is going to cover all of his creation here. Amazingly, this is what's amazing. He says, do you hunt the prey for the lioness? When... Who provides food for the raven? What about the mountain goats when they give birth? Now he's going to talk about the the creation bringing forth and birthing. Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Can you count the months till they bear? Do you know this? See, this is where humbling comes into the picture. When you step outside 
and you really acknowledge that God created it all, the breath that's flowing through my mouth, that's making the sounds coming forth, he gave it to me. The stars in the sky, all of these things that are being described. In fact, this one's one of the craziest ones, but it's the most provocative for thought to go. He says, God says to Job, who let the wild donkey go free? Who untied his ropes? He's wild. Who let him go free? Who untied his ropes? I gave him the wasteland. I did all this. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Now he's talking about the, the binding of animals. God, speaking of the ostrich, I gave her wisdom, although she appears kind of dumb and buries her eggs and leaves them there to be stepped on or stolen. I gave them to her. And what about the war, war horse, the hawk, the eagle? And when you get to chapter 40, you have just a small little response from Job. Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let that just kind of resonate a little bit. Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Well, here comes the next battering ram, brother, so you better bear down because God's saying, I'm going to speak again. (laughs) Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you will answer me. I told you there was going to be a test afterwards. (laughs) Haven't I been saying that for weeks? You read through this, and he's going to talk about how his sovereignty, if you keep reading through his sovereignty among the creation and what he created, and you're going to find the response to the creation, to God's sovereignty, to God's power, to God's omnipotence, and God's nature to know, to care for his creation. When Job replies in chapter 42, we did the whole book, wow. And Job says, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know, literally in the Hebrew, too miraculous, too impossible, too unsearchable, too unfathomable. That three-letter word in the Hebrew is a big rainbow for me to understand. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you shall answer me. My ears have heard you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. You know, the greatest lesson that I took away from this is if Job is a picture for the life of the saints... And if Job's friends depicted that, if you are righteous, you will prosper and you will be good and you'll have no problems, then Job wasn't a very good candidate because he was the best that God could find when he said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him. So the next time you're going through, this is the way I want to begin the new year. I didn't want to begin it by saying, look ahead to the great things the Lord's going to do because that you already know. That doesn't take any faith for looking forward to all the good things the Lord's going to do. But believe me, as we look forward to those good things where the Scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good, those who taste have the knowledge that in the process of tasting, we will encounter some tough times. And it is my job as pastor to get us to harness our minds, take the lesson today of Job and understand that there's nothing wrong with you If you're having to go through something, in fact, take it as the Apostle Paul said, our light affliction, which just endures for a little while. And I like the fact that we're never told what the little while is, although it could be a little while while we're down here, which if you're God, he doesn't wear a watch in a little while. is a little while. (laughs) But having said that, take knowledge in something. The trial of your faith, the... Eureka found in Job is found in each one of you. It's very easy to see life's circumstance, our possessions. We were praying for somebody earlier this week uh, who's kind of in a Job-like circumstance with broken health, 
medical bills mounting, the fear of losing their home, and just really earnestly prayed that they would just stay steadfast in the faith and believe God for the impossible. You know, we have a lot of people talking about miracles and the miracles of God. And we see miracles here in this ministry every day. There's one sitting right in front of me at the back of the room that I'm glad you're here today. We, uh, and you have nicer hair today than when I saw you in the hospital. I said, wow, what did you do to your wife? She had that really sexy hair when I came into the hospital room. And I said, wow. <laughs> you guys scare me. But what I want you to really focus on, the, this lesson today that should speak to us. God is sovereign. For if he created and made each one of us perfect as he has, and I don't say perfect without flaw, I mean perfect in his eyes, then surely he knows where we're at. And the one thing without fail, you can talk about all the knowledge you may have of this word, but when it comes to the rubber meeting the road, grabbing hold of the promises in God and by faith, because it is that moment when you grab hold the trial of your faith, not the trial of this body that may break. The faith that is inside me will go through the fire. How is gold purified by the fire? That it will come through, as First Peter said, more precious, because that is what pleases God, and that is what Satan hates. You can just take that, those two frames of reference, look at Job and say, after all this, Remarkably, God sends Job on his way. Basically, the friends are put in their place. Elihu, we don't, he's not mentioned again. The wife is not mentioned. So the lesson, the greater lesson is the heavenly transactions that occur, although we cannot see, have a purpose. Let me go back to the gold for a minute to show you what I mean, and then I'm done. I was in my office before I came out here, and I said, you know, that great gold rush, 1848 and then 1849, brought a slew of people west, all looking for gold. But, oh, maybe about 150 years before the gold rush, the Jesuits roamed this very land walking on, and their mission was not to find gold, by the way, uh, not this tangible gold, but they walked the whole California coast, and underneath their feet as they went, there was gold, and they knew it not. That wasn't their driving force. My point is that, like we are, earthen vessels, there is gold in here. We cannot see it, like those Jesuits that walked the California coastline. And only 150 years later, when people started to dig, did they find gold and that rush that came. But for 150 years previous or so, gold was there and no one knew it. Gold is here, if you'll just take stock of it today. It's very precious in God's sight. And whether it be just a little bit, like a grain of a mustard seed, or if some of you have been tried so much that you have a George Hamilton tan-like approach to your skin... (laughs) You at least know, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and I know that the trials that have brought me, like Job, when I come through, I will be like gold. In fact, for me, not just gold, but a treasure for Him. He loves His treasure. Whatever you're going through, please, let this be a lesson for the rest of the year, not the beginning of the year. It's all good today. Woohoo! 2nd of January, 2011. Woohoo! Wait a little while, folks. So put this in your back pocket, and when troubles come, just remember one thing. You're not abnormal. Go his children. He loves you. He loves me. And the thing he loves the most, that right in the middle of the crisis, we keep trusting him hanging our body on his word as though until our circumstance appropriate that promise we've claimed that then by faith we stand and look back and say, the Lord did it. The Lord did it. The Lord did it. So keep this as a year-long message. And as we 
close today, just remember the heavenly transaction, the thing you cannot see. There is a greater cloud of witnesses looking down, beholding what we, the family of God, do here, not to be perfect, just to trust him. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.